Hi, this is Rita, keeping it real scripture reading. And today we're reading from the first book of Maccabees. And the reason why we're reading from this book, it is because my granddaughter was watching Alexander the Great on Netflix. And I thought, where is that in the Bible? And it's in the first book of Maccabees, which is in the Apocrypha, which Apocrypha just means hidden. And these books that are in the Apocrypha, which we're going to focus on those in the beginning, they were in the Bible at one point, then they were taken out of the Bible, but doesn't mean they're not important as you're going to see. So this book, this is about the introduction. You can see that here. It's a historical a Jewish is what they say, history. Um, and it's about a family, the Maccabees. And then you see what the the theme is. It's like, you know, this book is is the good news Bible with the Apocrypha. I mean, some of the things like religious theme. I mean, this is really our book. It's spiritual. Um, so the most high, it shows how the most high is at work in history and will give victory as a reward to those who f are faithful to him. Uh, and then here's the outline and we'll kind of go through a chapter at a time, an outline of the contents. And we'll start with chapter one, which is about Alexander the Great. So this history begins with Alexander the Great, son of Philip of Macedonia, marched from Macedonia and attacked Darius. King of Persia and Media. Alexander enlarged the Greek Empire by defeating Darius and seizing his throne. He fought many battles, captured fortified cities, and put the kings of the regions to death. As he advanced to the ends of the earth, he plundered many nations. And when he had conquered the world, he became proud and arrogant. That sounds kind of familiar. By building up a strong army, he dominated whole nations and their rulers and forced everyone to pay him taxes. When Alexander had been emperor for 12 years, he fell ill and realized that he was about to die. He called together his generals, noblemen, who had been brought up with him since his early childhood, and he divided his kingdom, giving power to each of them. After his death, the generals took control, and each had himself crowned king of his own territory. The descendants of these kings ruled for many generations and brought a great deal of misery on the world. Wow. Like I said, I may not pronounce all this stuff correctly, but you can see it and look it up, and I suggest you do. Uh, because when I start to look it up, it's some of these things have um, uh, copywritten like commercials. So Antichus, Epiphanes, and the renegade Jews. So the wicked ruler Antichus Epiphanes, son of King Antichus, the third of Syria, was a descendant of one of Alexander's generals. Antichus Epiphanes had been a hostage in Rome before he became king of Syria in the year 137. At that time, there appeared in the land of Israel a group of treacherous, traitorous Jews who had no regard for the law and who had a bad influence on many of our people. Hmm. They said, let's come to terms with the Gentiles. For our refusal to associate with them has brought us nothing but trouble. Wow. Now you're going to see why they took it out. So this proposal appear, appealed to many people. And some of them became so enthusiastic about it that they went to the king and received from him permission to follow Gentile customs. So think about that. Think about, you know, at one point, the uh, Hebrews, Israel had their own customs, but it was causing them problems. So they said, well, let's just do what the Gentiles do and go with their customs so we can have it easier. Okay, 14, verse 14. They built in Jerusalem a stadium like those in the Greek cities. They had surgery performed to hide their circumcision, abandoned the Holy Covenant, started associating with Gentiles, and did all sorts of other evil things. Antichus attacks Egypt. When Antichus had firmly established himself as king, he decided to conquer Egypt. 
and rule that country as well as Syria. He invaded Egypt with a large fleet of ships. Think about that. They were ships back then. And a powerful army, including chariots, elephants, and cavalry. When the attack came, King Ptolemy of Egypt turned and fled. And many of his soldiers were killed. Antiochus was able to capture the fortified cities of Egypt and plunder the whole land. And then there is a map. I don't know how accurate it is, but here it is. It's a map of Palestine in the time of the Maccabees, where you can see where Syria is. Galilee. Galilee and Judea. You can see where everything is. The Dead Sea. Let's get an idea of that. Interesting. Okay. So, Antiochus persecutes Jews. In the year 143, after the conquest of Egypt, so he captured Egypt, Antiochus marched with a great army against the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. In his arrogance, he entered the temple and took away the gold altar and the lampstand and all its equipment, the table for the bread offered to the to the Lord or the Most High, the cups and the bowls, the gold fire pans, the curtain and the crowns. He took it all. He also stripped all the gold from the front of the temple and carried off the silver and gold and everything else of value, including all the treasures that he could find stored there. Then he took it all to his own country. He had also murdered many people and boasted arrogantly about it. There was great mourning everywhere in the land of Israel. Here's a picture of him taking all of the um, things out of the temple that he shouldn't have taken. Okay, and then this is like a little poem or something. Rulers and leaders groaned in sorrow. Young men and young women grew weak. The beauty of our women faded. Every bridegroom sang a funeral song, and every bride sat mourning in her room. All our people were clothed with shame, and our land trembled for them. Hmm. Two years later, Antiochus sent a large army from Macia against the towns of Judea. Judah. Judea. When the soldiers entered Jerusalem, their commanders spoke to the people, offering them terms of peace and completely deceiving them. Then he suddenly launched a fierce attack on the city, dealing in a major blow and killing many of the people. He plundered the city, set it on fire, and tore down its buildings and walls. Just cruelty. Oh, God. Just... Look how long this has been going on. And his army took the women and children as prisoners and seized the cattle. Then Antiochus and his forces built high walls and strong towers in the area north of the temple, turning it into a fort. They brought in a group of treacherous, traitorous Jews and installed them there. Hmm. They also brought in arms and supplies and stored in the fort all the loot that they had taken in Jerusalem. Okay, so all the things they took from that picture. This fort became a great threat to the city. Another poem-like portion. The fort was a threat to the temple, a constant evil menace for Israel. Innocent people were murdered around the altar. The holy place was defiled by murderers. The people of Jerusalem fled in fear and the city became a colony of foreigners. Jerusalem was foreign to its own people who had been forced to abandon the city. Her temple was as empty as a wilderness. Her festivals were turned into days of mourning, her Sabbath joy into shame. Her honor became an object of ridicule. Her shame was as great as her former glory, and her pride was turned into the deepest mourning. Antiochus now issued a decree that all nations in his empire should abandon their own customs and become one people. Sounds like integration, right? All the Gentiles and even many of the Israelites 
submitted to this decree. They adopted the official pagan religion, offered sacrifices to idols, and no longer observed the Sabbath. You know, this tells us why they wanted this book taken out, about how the Sabbath was no longer observed. The king also sent messengers with a decree to Jerusalem and all the towns of Judea, ordering the people to follow customs that were foreign to the country. He ordered them not to offer burnt offerings, grain offerings, and wine offerings in the temple, and commanded them to treat Sabbaths and festivals as ordinary work days. They were even ordered to defile the temple and the holy things in it. They were commanded to build pagan altars, altars, temples, and shrines, and to sacrifice pigs and other unclean animals there. They were forbidden to circumcise their sons and were required to make themselves ritually unclean in every way they could so that they would forget the law which the Lord had given through Moses and would disobey all of its commands. The penalty for disobeying the king's decree was death. The king not only issued the same decree throughout this whole his whole empire, but he also appointed officials to supervise the people and commanded each town in Judea to offer pagan sacrifices. Many of the Jews were ready to forsake the law and to obey these officials. They defiled the land with their evil and their conduct forced all true Israelites to hide wherever they could. On the 15th day of the month of Keslev, Keslev, in the year 145, King Antichus set up the awful horror on the altar of the temple, and pagan altars were built in the towns throughout Judea. Pagan sacrifices were offered in the front of the houses and in the streets. Any books of the law which were found were torn up and burned. Think about that. We can relate to that, how they're uh, trying not to have people read certain books. So think about if you couldn't read the Bible, you know, if it was torn up and burned. Okay. So any books of the law were found that were found were torn up and burned. And anyone who was caught with a copy of the law was put to death by order of the king. Month after month, these wicked men used their power against Israelites caught in the towns. On the 25th of the month, these same evil men offered sacrifices on the pagan altar erected on the top of the altar in the temple. Mothers who had allowed their babies to be circumcised were put to death in order in accordance with the king's decree. Their babies were hung around their necks. Oh, goodness. And their families, their babies were hung around their necks and their families. And those who had circumcised them were put to death. But many people in Israel firmly resisted the king's decree and refused to eat food that was ritually unclean. They preferred to die rather than to break the holy covenant and eat unclean food, and many did die. In his anger, God made Israel suffer terribly. It was First Maccabees chapter 1. Now, signing off until the next chapter.